has anyone ever said this to you? I pray you're doing well. Maybe this one you've heard. Pray tell, what do you mean? There's all kinds of common phrases we use or hear. With things in the world as they are right now, currently, many are asking questions like, maybe I should pray. How do I pray? I had somebody uh, call me, it's been a few weeks ago now, and said, you know, I'm really worried about how bad everything is. And a lot of my friends say, well, why don't you pray about it? And they said, how do I pray? You may say, how do you pray? Well, if you've never prayed, you didn't grow up around it, it could be a foreign concept. And so I trust all of you listening and viewing this message today or maybe later I am trusting that you pray. How often? When? That's not my business. But talking about prayer is my business. And might I ask this question for all of us? How many of us could use some suggestions for improving our prayers or our prayer life? Anybody? I sure could. All of us can use that kind of help. If we say, yes, I can, then we're in good company. Let's go over to Luke chapter 11. Because we sang this in the last song, and you'll remember the verse as we get into this message today. Luke chapter 11, as we begin to read this, I would like to make comments as we go through it. It came to pass that as when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he stopped or ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. And notice, as John also taught his disciples. Interesting, John taught what his Lord and Master also taught. That's a good indicator of what we should be doing. Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray. We just sang in the next to the last verse in that song that we should know that Jesus has taught us how to pray. You know, I have to thank the disciples, if I had been there and with them, they probably wondered how Christ was able to spend such a long time in prayer and so often. You ever ask yourself that question in your, your Christian life? You know, you might have times where you look up and say, wow, a lot of time went by. And other times like, man, the clock's not moving. Or maybe you don't time it at all. And that's, again, your choice whether you do that or not. As we read and study God's holy word, sometimes... The simplest of words escape our eyes or focus. We read something, we know what it says, we see what it says, and we miss the most important word in the sentence. We go right over it or ignore it or don't see it. Let me give you some example here. He said to his disciples, verse 2, and he said unto them, when you pray... Say, S-A-Y. We read that because that's really important. He said, when you pray, here's a word, say. Now, does that mean to recite verbatim? Not necessarily. But the word say, the Greek word lego, L-E-H-G-O, not like the Legos you play with, although it's spelled the same, refers to the sentiment or the substance of what is said. Vine's dictionary says the gist. In other words, so when you say, here's the gist of what you need to say, not necessarily the exact words. So we continue. Say, our Father which are in heaven, 
hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day by day. See, there's a little bit of change here. There's a reason for that. Day by day, our daily bread. Forgive our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let's keep that in the back of our head. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be going back and forth a little bit here today, this morning. I want to read Matthew chapter 6, first of all, verse 1 to 6. Again, we're talking about, and if you'd like a title for today, here's a good title you could use. If we'd use the model prayer, if we would use or we'd use the model prayer. Matthew chapter 6, take heed that you do not your alms before men. Now, what does that mean? To be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward to your Father which is in heaven. So what does that mean? We shouldn't do a webcast. We shouldn't have services. I shouldn't stand up in front of you. We shouldn't have, as Mr. Redding did, open with services and prayer. No, but you have to look at what is behind this and what was happening at that time and, frankly, what happens in the world today. Therefore, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrite do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Truly say unto you, they've got their reward. But when you do alms, be discreet. Let not your left hand know what the right hand does. That your homes may be in secret, and your Father, God notices, which sees in secret himself, shall reward you openly. And when you pray, not if, when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen. Truly I say, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. So let's now go to verse 7. Again, but when, not if you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. That's pretty, again, Christ is teaching us how to pray. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Don't use vain repetitions. You know, the Pharisees thought that they had to add a prayer helper to show you how to pray. This so-called Lord's Prayer is not meant to become a mindlessly repeated, meaningless ritual. And I've seen it. I've been around hundreds of people, and they say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And they're all doing it together, sincerely perhaps. But I've been to memorial services. I've been to weddings. I've been to worship services. The leader will have everyone repeat what is said. He reads his prayer. He's got it written out. There's a lot to be said about that too. But he reads it, and then he stops, and everyone says together, hear our prayer. Right, Gail? Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. And they're all together. God says, no, that's not what we should be doing. And verse 8, be not therefore. He keeps saying, don't. Here's when you want to learn, don't be like this example. Do not be like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask Him. So you don't necessarily have to explain to him in detail as if he didn't know. However, we should share our thoughts. I'm reminded of a little child. When we ask, tell us what you want. Well, you know they need food, a place to go to the restroom, a place to sleep, clothes, a bathe, protected. But you still ask them, what is it you want? And when my granddaughter, you know, 
whoa, whoa, whoa. I'd, many times I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't know what you want. And then mom would say, oh, she wants this. Because <laughs> you're with her all the time. But I'm like, I have no idea what mm means. And so we need to be communicating, talking with our father, going over the details. But he knows what we need. And there's a difference between needs and wants. And God knows the difference. Verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here's the manner. He says, after this manner. If I say at the Feast of Tabernacles, this is the manner of services we plan to have every day. What does that mean? This is how we are going to I suggest we follow for sake of unity and people know what to expect. This is what we're going to do. This manner. The Moffat translation says, let this be how you pray. The Phillips translation says, pray then like this. And the NIV says, this is how you should pray. So that is pretty, talk about a directive. You know, if I'm asking someone to read an x-ray or a document, this is the manner of how you do it. This is how you read it. Well, I don't want to do it that way, and well, but this is how you read it, okay, whatever it is. So we have, what I want to go through today as we look at is a prayer outline or a model, an example for you and me. Let's continue in an in-depth look at the model prayer and see what it can teach you and me regarding prayer. Now, if you have a perfect prayer life, go make a cup of coffee, take a nap. This isn't going to help you. But if you have areas to improve or would like to perhaps understand better what the model prayer is, this will be a benefit. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 9 to 13 our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Over and over in my life as I walk this Christian experience, I'm understanding a little better the importance of your will be done. I have my will, and sometimes it jives with God's. Most of the time it doesn't. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Emphasis for reason. And do not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I agree or so be it. The first thing I want to do is call your attention, as I emphasize, to do with the pronouns. What do I mean by that? There's no I's or me's or my's, rather our, us, and your. Let me repeat that. No I's, me's, or my's, but rather our, us, and your. What's the significance of that? Our. That first word of prayer is unselfish. Hour. In Philippians 2.4, in the New English translation, it says, each of you, each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but the interests of all the others as well. So when I ask that God protects those in the path of Ida, I don't say, please protect your members, those part of your body, and the rest of them, oh, well. No. And so, 1 Corinthians, the New Revised Standard 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. So many times... Most times, all the time, things that we've been through, somebody else out there has been through it, or worse. Whatever it is. You know, it says, the making of books, there is no end. By 
parents, wife's parents, my parents, if you will, too, recently had an auction and moved and sold a bunch of things, and they would agree with me, I think, if they're watching, that the making of books, there is no end. They're going to bring down some books to me, and then I'm going to have more books to try to figure out what to do with again. Also, the making of the challenges we go through is not uncommon to everyone. So let's go back now. Our Father, which art in heaven, this is how we address God. This is going to go against what some people are really pushing right now. We don't pray specifically. We're looking at the example here to Jesus Christ. The focus is not all about focusing on Jesus, although we can express thanks to Him at being at the right hand of the Father. And you can pray to Him, but the focus should not be there. The model prayer does not say pray to Jesus Christ. It simply doesn't. After this manner, Christ said, you shall pray to me. No, he doesn't say that. So we then go, continuing on, let's go for a minute over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 5. It does say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So absolutely going through him as the intercessor. But the focus should not be, verse 13, and whatsoever you shall do, ask in my name. He didn't say, ask me. He said, ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That Greek word, A-I-T-E-O, means aiteo. It's a request from one lesser in position, if you study the Greek. That word, ask. In my name. We pray in Jesus' name. That's why we say, as we close our prayers, by the authority, in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not just a nice thing to say at the end of a prayer because it fits and everybody does it. We're following the example. By the way, nothing says it has to be at the end, okay? You can say, and I've heard people do this, our Father, we come to you in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, and then they finish, amen. So there's a cultural setting, a uh, tradition that it must be at the end, and if you don't, then you can't give prayers at church, but that's a tradition. It doesn't say it has to be right there. Now, ask, who do we ask? Who else is there to ask? He says, you have to be asking the Father in the authority, by the authority, through the name of Jesus Christ. John chapter 16, John chapter 16, the disciples weren't used to this, okay? Because they had Jesus Christ right there, they were used to just asking Him for needs while He was there in the flesh. In verse 23, And in the day you shall ask me nothing, truly I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you. And so, hereafter, he instructs them to address their requests, their prayers, to God the Father. That had to be a whole new paradigm for them. They weren't used to that. They were used to say, hey, boss, <laughs> you know, hey, master, hey, Lord. Verse 24, here, too, have you asked nothing in my name, Ask and you shall receive, and your joy may be full. So he promises God will give them what they ask according to his will, of course. Verse 26, And that day he shall ask in my name, and I shall say unto you that I will ask the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. So Jesus doesn't need to ask, the Greek E-R-A-T-A-O, 
God in our behalf because He knows God will do it because He loves us. John chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, He says, I will do it because He and His Father were one. Complete harmony, complete unity. Let's go back to our Father, which is in heaven. We are literally a family, and that's a whole subject by itself. We'll be talking about some of that during the upcoming Feast of Tabernacles. An intimate, loving relationship, not just a master-slave, a father, a loving head, a protector, a provider. You know, sometimes we are so self-willed, we don't want to let God be our Father. We want to work it out ourselves. We want to do it. We don't need help. We got this until it doesn't go well, and then we're like, save me. Kids are like that. Husbands and wives can be like that. Brethren can be like that. All of us can be like that. He's our Father in heaven. So, does that mean our Father lives here in Spanish Fort? Well, His Son, Jesus Christ, lives in us, I pray, through His Spirit in our hearts and minds. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 2. Again, I have these written down in my notes. That's why I'm not flipping my pages quickly. But Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. Do not be rash with your mouth. And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth. Well, therefore, let your words be few. Boy, could we all not learn from this one. Don't be rash with your mouth. And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. In other words, engage the brain and the mind and the heart before opening the mouth. Or as the proverb says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. For God is in heaven and you're on earth, therefore let your words be few. We begin then with the realization of whom we are addressing, are addressing, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Is that just some ancient King James word that sounds really religious? Hallow means holy, sanctified, set apart special, which is the opposite of common. You know, nowadays they want to tell everybody, everybody's special. Well, you are, but you're not. Because we're all part of the human race, so we're all common. But we are special. But he says, to feel reverence for, to honor as holy. How can we hallow God's name or hallow? How can we hallow God's name? I'll give you some examples of that. Number one, by acknowledging His greatness. Isaiah 40, you can look these up later, but Isaiah 40, the chapter, extols God's greatness. When we pray, one of the things we can do, and I do this as I spread my Bible out, and I read the Word of God. That's as pure as you can get. I read it in my prayers Read Psalm, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 40. And you can't come back away from that not realizing how great God is. There's a song, I would love to do it at the feast. It, I can hear the tune. Our God is an awesome God. Da 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 Our God is an awesome God. I love that song because you stop and you realize how great God is. All of the stuff going on in the world right now. So many people are absolutely freaked out, afraid. They've forgotten to acknowledge God's greatness. Because you're not going to worry. And if you die in this life, you're going to take a long nap before you're resurrected. Now, you may say, well, you're an idiot. I'm scared to death of dying. Well, we don't need to be. I'm not saying we want to be, but it's very painful. Psalm 104 is another one. It details how God provides for all His creation. I love sitting in my backyard having coffee in the mornings and watching all the things the little creatures do. You have dragonflies and hummingbirds 
and birds and squirrels and big rabbits and occasionally a coyote. We try to keep them out. But you have all these creatures and bugs and butterflies and yesterday we had a hummingbird moth, so my wife says. I listened, I couldn't hear him humming, but you have all these creatures and then the other day we had a hard rainstorm and all the birds were trying to find places in the bushes and the trees to hide. It was funny because it came all of a sudden. I just enjoy watching that because God provides for every one of them. Now we give them a little bird bath so they can come and enjoy the water and cool off and get a drink and I guess socialize, whatever they do. Sometimes there's like seven or eight different species in the same bird bath and they're not fighting. Oh boy, humans could learn from that. But it details Psalm 104. Psalm 8, David marvels at man's destiny in light of the magnitude of God's creation. When we get our mind off of God's creation and what, how great He is, the troubles begin. Because we see humanly what God says don't worry about. It's a good time to prime the pump with these passages and others about God's greatness and His blessings. The Word of God is perfect and holy. When we pray, our words often are not. Remember the song we used to sing, sing at the feast and services? Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord, praise Him in the heavens and praise Him in the heights, praise Him, you angels, you know? His mercy never fails. Another way that we can hallow God's name is by praising and thanking Him. Many passages in the book of Revelation reveal angels praising God. Around the throne there is a multitude, hundreds of thousands of angels. What are they doing? They're singing praises, honor, glory, and power unto Him that sits upon the throne. One person once said, well, he's just a narcissist. He's egocentric. I'd be careful about saying that about God. When he tells us to praise him. But that's man. We always have the answer for everything, don't we? Many passages in the book of Revelation, there are 236 occurrences I counted of praise in the New King James, 125 in the Psalms about praising God. The New Living Translation in Philippians 4 and verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Worrying, fretting, watching the news, fussing. Oh, what are we going to do? That's not praising God. Well, I've got to call everybody and tell them how bad it is. Oh, I feel like my stomach. I can't sleep. I've been there. You're not focused on how great God is. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. I once worked under a minister in training that told me 90% of his prayers or more were giving and expressing thanks. And knowing him pretty well, I would say that's true. What is our focus? Matthew chapter 6, let's go back there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. If we find ourselves full of fret, worry, consternated, unsettled, upset, trepidatious, something is topsy-turvy, okay? Something's topsy-turvy and needs to be righted and corrected to work. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, after we talk about hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. That's the first thing on the prayer want list. <laughs> Matthew 6.33, we all know this scripture, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added. Is that camera on too? Oh, okay. Well, I won't look at it then if you're not using it. I just saw a light on it. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It is the first 
in time, the first of importance. This needs to be a priority. Your kingdom come. Do we pray about the need for the kingdom of God? Now, stay with me here, but I'm not praying that God will just bring all the Americans out of Afghanistan as my first prayer. My first prayer is, we need and we pray your kingdom come. And I may offend some with that, especially if you have family over there. Before I ask God to protect me, provide for me, all the things that are important, I go first, I must, you must say, we pray your kingdom comes. That's why I hope you're looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles and what it's about. Because it will get our mind, if we let God, focus on your kingdom come. And then after the Feast of Tabernacles, the millennium, the ultimo grandia, or octavo dia in Spanish, the eighth day or the last great day, when everybody will have an opportunity. And God's kingdom will come, and everything as we see it now, virus, Afghanistan, hurricanes, economy, lying, politics, it will be gone. That's the only solution, not a vaccine, not bringing our troops out, not everybody having a million dollars in the bank, no inflation, no cancer, no heart disease. Do you know what? If we don't die of disease, we're still going to die of something. It's horrible. It should scare us to death. It's called old age. And I'm sorry, but when you look at how great God is and you realize how everything fits, it starts to make you not worry so much. Christ says in Matthew 6, God says all these things will be added. Ezekiel chapter 9, this needs to be part, this needs to be part of our prayers. And I have talked about this recently. Yeah, okay. Ezekiel chapter 9. I'd like us to consider this in the present situation and the way the world has always been, but now that we have modern technology that lets you know exactly what's happening within seconds, it tends to really make our hearts skip sometimes because we see everything and know everything. I never understood how the two witnesses would be able to be seen all at once. Now we know. But back in the 70s when I preached, it was like, I don't know how that's going to happen. Well, now I do because... You know when there's a hurricane in Cuba or Cuba. You know when there's soldiers in Afghanistan. Now, whether what you're seeing is true or not, who knows? Not everything you see on the news media is true. I never forget the big thing that came out from one of the major new network about Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. And I was right there, right where it was filmed. It was from months earlier with a totally different situation. But that was the current state to put panic and fear in everybody. It's still being done. We're manipulated. Don't be manipulated, folks. Don't believe everything you hear. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And if you can't prove it, there's probably a reason for it. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. This is symbolic. And set a mark. Doesn't mean a mark of the beast. Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, My hearing, go after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have pity. And utterly slay the old and young maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men who were before the house. 
It says, God will save those who sigh and cry about the abominations of the world. Do we love this world? There are things we can enjoy, a fine meal, a new car, a nice house, a great vacation, a good night's sleep, whatever that is. You know, the book of Lamentations talks about Jeremiah's sorrow regarding the suffering of Israel. I might suggest it's okay, whether you still get the newspaper, I don't know if they even make too many of them anymore, but use your phone to spread out the news in front of you and talk to God about the tragedies. Say, Father, this is what's happening. Isaiah chapter 37, Isaiah 37, verse 14. Isaiah 37, 14. After Hezekiah received received the letter from the messengers and read it. He went up to the Lord's temple and he spread it out before the Lord and Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and please listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. When I see the various things continuing to be plastered that go against everything God is about and is, I pray this prayer. Here's something else we can do. Pray about world conditions and prophecy. Matthew 24, we are familiar, verse 6 says, all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. So we can't skip from verse chapter 1 to chapter 10 and have read the whole book. Well, we would love that, that Christ would come back and all this other stuff before wouldn't happen. That's what we've always wanted. But that's not what happens. So pray about, say, God, if it be your will, that this nation, this world, that these nations would repent and draw to you that all this wouldn't have to happen. Do you know what? It may be prophesied, but God can change that. You remember the story of Jonah and Nineveh? God said, I'm going to destroy it. And Jonah was like, good, them dudes need it. And then they repented. And God said, I'm not going to kill them. And Jonah was really frosted about that. God said, what? I'm God. So you say, well, no, prophecy has to be fulfilled. Well, it does, but it doesn't. In your life, you and I repented. God forgave us. We are a new creation in that process of living, as I wrote in my letter last night. It's not a one-time thing. Do you think God at times says, okay, I'm not going to, they're not going to have to go through this because they're really trying and their heart is right. I'm going to extend some mercy and that's not going to happen. Oh, absolutely. Other times he says, no, nope, you need to go through this because that's the only way you're going to solidify your character with me. And I'll know, just like Abraham. And so, Praying for God's work and the various parts of that. Praying for the kingdom to come. That's when, by the way, we keep talking about the work. Well, the real work begins when Christ returns. Think about that one. We think we're busy now. Maybe, well, we're doing this and, you know, over the years, well, we're doing the work and our heart's in the work. Well, the part of the heart of hearts in the work is letting Christ live in us and how do you live when Christ returns or are we going to be busy? It's a good thing we don't have to sleep, those that are spirit. We are never going to get caught up with everything we have to do. As Christ said, we must be about our Father's business. I can ask you to pray for those that serve Him, His ministry, His people, our family responsibilities in serving God's people, for more laborers for the harvest. I would desperately love, locally, 
to have a song leader besides me every week. I am looking forward to the feast. I don't have to lead songs at the feast yet. <laughs> I have plenty of speakers that God has blessed us with. Not I, we do. We're all in this together. They're not mine. Pray that we can be protected from censorship, from the evil one and his minions, that we can keep doing what we're doing. All of the various bodies, parts of the body of Christ, not just this ministry, but those that are desiring to serve God, to pray for that, to reach new people, to open doors. I can share this for safety and travel, for finances. I'm just going to say this, but many people now don't tithe or give offerings. I've talked to many different ministers in, in different fellowships, but also in, in Methodist church and Presbyterians and even in the Catholic church. They've said, people don't tithe anymore or give offerings. So pray about that. That was one of the things that this virus has affected. A lot of people aren't attending. So if they're not there, you know, charities, charities suffer. There's some very, very, my mom, she may be listening, but this group came up from Kansas City, I think, a church, a bunch of people, retired, and did all this work in her lawn from the storms they had and took, brought everything, cleaned it up, brought it to the front for the city to take. And they said, all we want to do when we leave is pray with you. And they did. And they said, take care. It worked all day. Boy, we could learn from that in the body of Christ, I think, just a little tiny bit, couldn't we? There's a lot more than just preaching the Word. There's living it. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a kind of a vague thing to some folks. Matthew 6.10, pray for God's will to be done on earth as it's done in heaven. The whole earth. Because that's not going to happen until the kingdom of God is set up in the work, the decisions, the plans. For clearer understanding, here's one you need to be real careful with, but pray for correction. Please be careful with that. Don't say, God, correct me and give it to me. Don't do that. Just saying. In our personal lives, Ask God to help us see who we are in our personal lives. I really had to go through that a few years ago and still am, but it's like, it's when you go through challenges, you understand more what God is doing with all of us. John chapter 17, verse 11 says, I am now no longer in the world, but these... You and I and His disciples that are in the world, I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Let me ask a question, and I know there are many fellowships watching here. All part of the body of Christ. Are we one? Far from it. Are we one? We should be. Some are trying to do that. I would say most are. Are we one? Or are you okay and I'm bad, or I'm okay and you're bad? And you know what I mean. That's got to be eradicated within the body. Because the body can't say, I've decided that the thumb is really good, but the little pinky, we don't need you, get. You can't be part of the hand. And if we're not careful, we'll do that with folks in the world that are trying to follow God to where they've been, their mind has been opened. So I like to say, stop separating the sheep and the goats and the wheat and the chaff and let God sort that out and just love God and love your fellow man and serve them and be committed to obeying God to the best of your ability and come out of the world and its ways, we have to live here, so we're not going to have a commune, but come out of its ways, its culture. Christ then, in that, was praying for unity as disciples. Do you think his disciples were all buddies and they all got along? Read what took place. Well, John was the one who Jesus loved. 
And Peter was always pretty out there gregarious and trying to stir things up. That was his personality. What were they like? Now we go to verse 11. Uh, I believe I'm in Matthew 6. Let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Give us this day, Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray for our daily needs, yours and those of others. Bread symbolizes vital necessities, physical and spiritual. Physical and spiritual. Remember what Matthew 4, 4 says? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So the Day of Atonement, you may struggle with that. After about 23 and a half hours, what if God said, I always enjoy this thought, what if God said, okay, I want you to fast for seven days, and then the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be one day where you can eat and drink and rejoice before God? He didn't. He just wanted to remind us again, the only way to be close to Him is spiritually, and that we've got to have our adversary out of the way and our own self and be at one meant with God. So the time you would use for making food and eating, you can use that for something better, spiritually. John chapter 6, he said, Jesus Christ is the bread of life we should be seeking. Matthew 6, verse 34 I'll read from the New Living Translation. It's a little more understandable, although the other one's clear too. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow is going to bring its own worries. That's what I don't like about the media, because you have 14 days sometimes to worry about what is coming, whatever it is. And you're always forewarned about everything. In mental health, we tell people, take one day at a time. Stop worrying about things you can't control. Oh, you know, Facebook is good about this, throwing up ads. You may be, have symptoms of rectal cancer or foot cancer or throat cancer or brain cancer or lupus. Or If you have a spot on your left knuckle of your, you know, pinky, then you have beginning, possibility beginning stages of prostate cancer. It's like all these things, people get... Just fearful, right? Well, there's going to be a variant of a variant of a variant of a variant coming in about 36 months, right? And you're going to have to have another booster with the booster with the booster with the booster. All that does is freak people out. Do your best, live your life. You know, Hulk Hogan used to say, just say your prayers and take your vitamins. (laughs) You know, and people kind of laugh, but... Honestly, we do the best we can, but you can't outrun this physical life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Both physical and spiritual needs are provided on a daily basis. Remember manna? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 says, The inward man, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, The inward man is being renewed day by day. The outward man perishes. I'm getting ready to have a birthday here in just a few weeks or days. And I can't believe time went on this long because it wasn't supposed to. When I was a baby, I was never going to be out of grade school and never high school and never get married. Now I'm looking at someday maybe semi-retiring and have a granddaughter. It's like, what happened? Well, Are we being renewed spiritually day by day? I'm reminded of the Scripture that says, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is not referring to, to financial debts. 
by the way. Wouldn't it be nice? How about what we really should be concerned about, spiritual bankruptcy. Just pray for forgiveness and that we'll forgive others because if we do not, verse 14, if you do forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, neither will your Father forgive you. Some of us have a difficulty forgiving. I do. If you've really been hurt, it's hard to forgive people. But we must. Luke chapter 11, verse 4, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is then indebted to us. I oftentimes open and close my prayers with, Father, forgive me. And sometimes I throw in, because I don't know what I'm doing. But many times I do know what I'm doing. We ask God to forgive us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, we have to forgive in order to be forgiven. You might need to, and this is something we can pray about, for God to help us forgive others. Praying for our enemies can help us be willing to forgive. And Matthew 18, 35 says we must forgive from the heart. Not, well, I forgive you, but if you fell over dead, it'd be okay with me. No. We must forgive from the heart. Verse 13 and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Pray for protection from temptation. Those sometimes come in the form of tests and challenges and the, the buzzword for the church, trials. It's also scriptural. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41 says, Jesus Christ tells us to pray not to enter into temptation. Sometimes we need to, in our mind, see something or be aware of something, and we need to do like Forrest Gump. Just run, Forrest, run. God sometimes allows or even tests us to build us up. You know, many times we say, oh, I can't possibly do that. God says, yes, you can Watch what I can do through you. I can't do that. Oh, watch what I can do through you if you just let me. You know? Just let me. Satan tempts us to tear us down. It's the same Greek word. God tests us to build us up. God doesn't want harm or evil to come to us. Our adversary would love to see us just be snuffed flat out. 2 Peter 2, verse 9, I'm giving these so you can write them down, but 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials. If you're in a bad one, put your relationship with God first and trust Him. He can take you out of it. Oh, He can't fix me financially or physically or emotionally. Yes, He can, because many times it's you or me is the problem. It's not your mate. You may think it is because they don't pray and fast enough or they don't do whatever's right. Or maybe it's your boss, you're just a rotten boss. Or maybe it's your neighbor, just a rotten neighbor. And I once had somebody talk to me. They said, I'd like to fellowship with your church, but all the other churches I've been to, I leave after a few months because the people are just ornery, unfriendly, and cliquish. And I said, well, how many of you attended? He said, about 30. I said, well, you might find it the same way here. Folks may be cliquish, unfriendly, mean. Well, I don't think so. It doesn't seem like it. I said, did the other ones seem like it? No, not when I started. So eventually, maybe it's you. Well, I fast and I pray and I do this and I visit widows and I travel and speak in church areas and okay, but really, this is a pretty nice place. 
Now, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it can be that word toxic, and you need to not be part of it spiritually, by the way. Pray for protection and deliverance from the evil one. 1 Peter 5.8 says, He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is called the tempter. Oh, and he's good. You know, one of the ways he can tempt you is to get you wrapped up in the news media while everything going on, that your mind is off of God and he's tempted you and you've been drawn right in and you're stuck. I love to fish. And I've never yet done any type of fishing where you don't let him take the bait and try to swallow it. If you re- and then you set the hook and you keep it tight and you just keep reeling because once you've got them, you just, but you have to tempt them. If it's a catfish, it has to be a good stink bait, something you can hardly stand holding. Or blood, or if it's a shark, something bloody. You know, if it's fish, a live shrimp works sometimes better than a frozen one. You have to tempt that. You know, you think we're tempted? We're tempted for all kinds of things. And we are then drawn away, and once we're enticed, then. It's a good idea to pray for protection daily, spiritual from the evil one, physical, financial, health. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 says, 2 Timothy 3 1, in the last days there will be very difficult times. As the Bachman Turner Overdrive song says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Da, da. <laughs> we have it. It's not going to get better. If a president we had comes back, it's not going to get better. There might be a small smoothing out of the bumps, but, right? 1 Corinthians 10.13, 1 Corinthians 10.13 in the New English Translation, no trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others, that is common to humanity. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you're able to bear, but with the trial will provide a way out so you can be able to endure it. And some of the ways out from that may be dying. God promises not to allow us to be tried or tempted beyond what we can bear. A way of escape to be able to endure it, not necessarily avoid it. Did you hear what I said? the ability to endure it. He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. We can and can and should claim these promises as we go through these times. Are you praying that God will provide the food and lodging and shelter and what you need as things get worse? I am. Are you praying that we can continue reach with this gospel of the good news of the kingdom? I am that God will give us strength in spite of our humanity? Pray for deliverance from the greatest of all evils that's coming yet physically, the great tribulation. Well, we don't have to go through that. If you just stay praying, you'll be okay. No. Luke 21, 36 is to be alert spiritually at all times, praying that you'll have the strength to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. And then it ends, Matthew chapter 6, and then it ends, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's called a doxology. It's a lit a liturgical formula of a praise to God. Literally a praise to Him. End your prayer the way you started, with praise and thanks to God. Do that every time. And then you say, Amen, which means, I agree, so be it. Let it be so. Or as Donat Picard, Captain Picard said, make it so. So, Let me go back through the seven points I had. Address your prayers to God the Father in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Hallow God's name. Pray for the needs of others, not only your own. Pray for God's kingdom to come. Pray for God's will to be done. Pray for forgiveness and to be able to forgive others better, no matter who they are. 
for deliverance and protection. And you and I should never again have to say, I don't know what to pray about. We can use the model prayer that Jesus gave to teach us how to pray. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, The earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. If we use the model prayer as a prayer outline, certainly it's an important way to make our prayers effective. Hence my title, If We'd Use the Model Prayer. I hope you will. I hope I will. Join me in prayer as we finish today and conclude. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as Christ instructed us, and with your right hand is Jesus Christ. We thank you for the plan since the foundation of the world that encompasses all human beings made a little bit lower than the angels. But, Father, we will be part of your family spiritually. It is coming. It's a promise. We must do our part. We must yield to you and let you live in us, you and Jesus Christ, through your Spirit. We just pray for your forgiveness, your help, your encouragement. Father, please bless your people. Protect them. As we come up to the Feast of Tabernacles and the Fall Feast of the Feast of Trumpets and Day of Atonement and the Sabbaths, and fellowshipping. Just protect us, bless us, be with us, keep the evil from us. Pray that you'll sustain the weather, that we can observe the feast at the various locations. We have many here on the Gulf Coast as part of the body, all of these worshiping and fellowshipping in your presence. We pray your blessing on the food today. Nourish us with it. Strengthen us spiritually, Father. Help us to be drawn closer together as we discuss and talk about you. And we just thank you for all the blessings you give. We praise to you, your name. We thank you and we come to you in the very authority and by the name of Jesus the Christ as we were instructed to do. And again, thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.